Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patrons, Jeremy A and Gian J. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. First up today, we have Electrek reporting that sources familiar with the matter are saying Tesla has communicated to its employees it expects to lose the full credit on the Model 3 standard range. This would be because it's using LFP cells that actually come from China, which would imply most of the raw materials, which makes up one half, and most of the components, which make up the other half of the battery pack are coming from places outside of North America and countries that don't have free trade agreements with the United States. Lending some credibility to that report is the fact that yesterday afternoon Reuters said the Treasury Department is set to release guidance next week on Wednesday about the sourcing requirements for the EV tax subsidies. The Treasury will also issue guidance on selling tax credits and making them refundable, which would allow entities without tax liability to actually use them. Based on the initial requirements, I think most people were expecting the standard range Model 3 to lose at least half of the IRA tax credit, but now Tesla is saying it expects to lose the full $7,500 credit for this one model. This is still pending official guidance, but the communication from Tesla to employees is saying access to the full credit it could change if delivery is done on April 1st rather than by March 31st. Arguably one of the bigger storylines in all of global automotive right now is the price war in the Chinese market. Everybody's talking about it and now folks are saying this is threatening to drive some automakers out of business. The director of a consultancy in China said Tesla created havoc for the rest of the market, where at least 30 more car makers have also cut prices. Pause if you'd like, but here are the maximum discounts in Yuan and where each automaker has fallen when it comes to their specific price cuts. As Tesla Daily highlighted last night, the CAAM is now calling to end this price war because the havoc is too much. Here we have quotes from NIO's CFO. China's auto market is going through a very profound reshuffle. We need to go through this price war at the beginning of the year. Then we expect the industry to go through some profound fundamental consolidation. It's almost consensus that China has too many automakers. 155 new pure electric and plug-in hybrid models are expected to be unveiled in China this year alone. That same industry consultant said Tesla has several billion dollars they can use for the purpose of further price reductions if needed, while most of these others do not. And we have the director of China research at Fitch Rating saying companies without sound external funding, companies that are going to need to raise capital, may face survival challenges in the coming two years. Just in case you're new, absolutely no, Tesla is not one of these companies. The director of Sino Auto said, it's going to stay brutal through the middle of next year, it's really existential for some of the weaker players. What we have here is Tesla doing a simple price cut and now all anybody can talk about is how many automakers in the Chinese market, the most competitive in the world, some are going to be destroyed. And I know many of you will remember all of the FUD we were hearing just a few weeks ago with so many people talking about Tesla's demand in China is cratering, Tesla's demand in Europe is cratering. No. It's not. Even Troy, who pulls absolutely no punches, is saying the end of quarter delivery push in Europe is stronger than I expected. You know, it's funny because it's almost like what we've been saying here now for the past year that Tesla is by far the best position to handle a recession in an automotive slowdown is actually starting to play out and show up in the data. Who would have thunk it? In case you see this tweet from Tesla charging and see this image and start to think, hey, here's our first V4 supercharger location in the United States. Not true, these are actually urban chargers, a much older design. They only charge up to 72 kilowatts, not V4, although they do look somewhat similar. Ashley and I really enjoyed going out to eat, but over the past few years, there were times when we could not do this, so we looked for ways to try to keep our date nights going, and that's how we ended up finding Factor. It actually started out as a recommendation from a good friend of ours that was raving about it, so we tried it, and I'm going to get yelled at for playing this video, but it's a real, unscripted reaction from Ashley. What about never got this because this is vegan. It's like peanut bootable. This is sick. It tastes 
So good. I literally have the box. I'm saving it. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your door, made by a team of gourmet chefs. Factor meals are ready in under two minutes. There's no prep, no cooking, no mess, no cleanup. It's super easy to adjust your order size. You can easily skip weeks altogether. And Factor does have smoothies and desserts as well, which Ashley and I like to get to celebrate life's milestones. So if you wanna check it out, you can head to factor75.com, which is also linked below. You can use my code electrified50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Thank you to Factor for sponsoring this video and thanks to all of you for supporting the channel. Tesla has released extended warranties now for all of its sexy lineup, depending on your model year. And if you still have the basic warranty still intact, then through the mobile app, you can actually upgrade to these extended warranties if you'd like. This fact sheet will be linked below. Here we have the document laying out the actual terms and conditions. Again, it'll be below. The extended agreement period is set to be two years or 25,000 miles, whichever comes first. And the cost for this extended warranty will range from $1,800 for a Model 3 up to $3,500 for a Model X. And here are the footnotes for you in case you're interested in learning more. Most electric vehicles have two main warranties. There's a vehicle or the bumper to bumper warranty, and then there's separately a powertrain warranty that in the case of an EV would cover the actual battery pack and the motors. As you can see, these new extended warranties do not cover the battery and the drive unit. So what would this be for? Well, things like electronics, the screen, the CPU, etc. I would just caution, it looks like this extended service agreement has its own terms and conditions. So it looks like it's not functioning as a regular extension of the basic warranty from Tesla. AKA do your own homework, but here is one of those screenshots of the ability to actually add this right through the mobile app. Ford has finally released its refounding Ford initiative, breaking out the financial reporting across three new divisions rather than doing it by geography like they did in the past. So we have Ford Blue, which which is for ICE vehicles and hybrids. Notice how hybrids go in the ICE category where they belong. Model E for full battery electric vehicles and Ford Pro for commercial. Props to Jim Farley and the Ford team for providing this level of transparency. I did, however, find a mistake in the slide deck. Ford is saying the auto industry is being disrupted by these four factors when the reality is this. It needs to be highlighted that this new recast for new segments data is pro forma and unaudited. So no, it's not official data, but it'll get us in the neighborhood. We have Ford's ICE and hybrid division doubling up in terms of EBIT from 2021 to 2022, further driving home the point that the profit centers for legacy OEMs really is going to be the ICE and hybrid business. In 2021, Ford's Model E division, full battery electrics, lost just shy of $1 billion in terms of EBIT, which is also sometimes referred to as operating profit or operating margin. That doubled last year up to $2.1 billion in terms of a loss. Good news for Ford, Ford Pro, the commercial division did see growth in 2022 relative to 2021. Last year, Ford's Model E division was essentially operating with negative 40% margins. For comparison, last year, Tesla's hovered around positive 26%. I did listen to Ford's presentation and they said they're expecting these EBIT margins to potentially break even at the end of this year for the Model E division and could potentially turn positive sometime in 2024. Ford's longer term goal of positive 8% EBIT margins for the Model E division by the end of 2026 are said to be accomplished by these different factors, the battery, design and engineering, and bigger scale. With Ford aiming for 8% EBIT margin of this Model E division by the end of 2026, for some comparison, if we use Tesla's operating margin, that's hovered between 15 and 20%. And again, this is Ford's goal for roughly four years from now, whereas Tesla is present day better than twice 
Ford's goal. Now, I would definitely caution that comparing the way Ford calculates its EBIT margin to the way Tesla comes to its operating margin, there will definitely be some differences, but it's a loose comparison. Oftentimes, the most important factor is the guidance, and from that standpoint, Ford said Ford Blue for 2023 is expected to essentially be flat year over year, when in 2022, it was growing pretty significantly, so this is a slowdown for sure. Model E losses are expected to continue to accelerate up to a $3 billion loss for this year. Luckily for Ford, again, Ford Pro is set to buoy them a bit. They're expecting Ford Pro to almost double when it comes to EBIT in 2023 which when you do the math would effectively leave Ford flat year over year in terms of operating profit. May will be a big month for Ford as they report their Q1 earnings on May 2nd and then on May 22nd, they will hold a capital markets day for investors. And obviously we should not be expecting Ford's new Model E, which should be treated as a startup business to somehow already be competing with Tesla. That's not realistic at all. But to give some context with Ford shooting for a 2 million global EV production run rate by the end of 2026, just remember Tesla is already there basically this year and we know they're not standing still. And one big point that I think will go way overlooked in this whole thing is the shrinking profitability of Ford Credit or its financing arm that historically has played a big role in Ford's overall profitability. In 2021, Ford Credit did around 4.7 billion in EBIT that dropped to 2.7 billion last year. Going back to Ford's projections for this year, they have Ford Credit declining further down to $1.3 billion for the year. So from 4.7 billion in 2021 down to 1.3 billion expected this year, that's a major decline. As Gene Munster pointed out, if you do the math, Ford was losing over $34,000 in terms of EBIT for every EV delivery last year. For comparison, Tesla makes in the neighborhood of $10,000 for every EV that it sells. Again, comparing the two right now doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not fair at all to Ford. It's just to give you some context. Another way to frame this, let's just use a hypothetical number. Ford was selling each EV for $50,000. It would have to start selling that same EV for $84,000 just to break even, which is equivalent to raising prices by roughly 70%. Honestly though, overall, great job by Ford. Love the transparency. I'm rooting for Farley and their team to make it work, especially the new Model E division. We have to give them time and grace. Tesla lost money for a long time. Don't ever forget that. So hopefully Ford can make some moves and get to profitability with its Model E. I would just add one of the main questions is how long can Ford maintain profits in the Ford Blue division as ICE sales continue to deteriorate in the years ahead? And can they ramp up or get to profitability in its Model E division before Ford Blue is essentially a shell of what it once was? In a new video from Monroe that was honestly a bit salesy, you'll kind of see why I feel that way in a second. They say, breaking news, Amprius creates a 500 watt hour per kilogram battery. Before we even touch on this, and it's something that Monroe did not even mention in this video, the real questions for battery breakthroughs are how much do they cost and can you manufacture this at scale because breakthroughs like this have been announced now for decades and most of them never really see the light of production. But let's give Monroe some grace and the benefit of the doubt going forward. So we have this new gravimetric energy density of 500 watt hours per kilogram, which relative to Tesla's 4680s would be more than 2x in terms of that energy density and also over a 2x from Tesla. Tesla's 2170s. Shifting over to volumetric energy density, once again, it's the same story. This new Amprius battery would be over a 2X from the current industry standard. How far along is this company when it comes to production? But these guys um, are in the process now of developing a new 75,000 square foot facility in uh, Brighton, Colorado. This is gonna be about a five gigawatt hour uh, manufacturing capacity. The word on how Amprius is doing this is by replacing graphite with silicon. What they're doing <laughs> is a little neat because they're using the silicon nanowires, so kind of like how carbon yeah. does nanotubes. They're doing the same thing, and then they're coating it with um, a resin-like material to keep it stable. But uh, they're using a first principles um, aspect where you're going from a most energy dense material that can hold a lot of lithium. So silicon can hold about seven times as much lithium per cubic volume or unit volume 
as graphite. So that's how they're able to achieve this. I suppose it's true, even if it was 2x the cost of the industry standard, maybe you could have the battery packs be half the size, which would save in weight, but way too early to tell. We'll just see how this plays out. How's Honda doing, you ask? Well, Honda Australia says its first pure EV model is unlikely to reach the shores before the end of this decade. In the midterm, they will focus exclusively on hybrid vehicles. Honda's chief executive said, when we look at the Australian market's ability to cope with electric, we don't think it's quite there. I guess that's fine, Honda, just less competition for Tesla to continually dominate the Australian market. Don't forget, check out Factor linked below. You can find me on Twitter at DylanLoomis22. Hope you have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did, and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.